Isabel Zuleta is the leader of Movimiento Rios Vivos, Alive Rivers, in Colombia, an environmental movement to defend the territories and communities affected by dam construction and mining projects in the north of the country. Isabel's community has suffered forced displacement, occupation, and abuses by police, military, private security companies, and the guerrilla forces alike. Isabel Zuleta is a fellow of the Resilience Fund on disappearances related to organized crime. She is currently implementing a project to recover bodies around the Cauca River. All this while dealing with the pandemic that has left people in her community more vulnerable to be recruited or silenced by criminals. 83 environmentalists were killed in Latin America in 2008, according to Global Witness. Colombia is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for defenders like Isabel, who has been recently the target of espionage and a defamation campaign. Why are environmental defenders at such a high risk? With the environment, many things are at stake. Many lives, vital resources for humanity, sacred lands, Deforestation and fires, massive floods, displacement and human exploitation have been the consequences of violent land takeovers by colonizers, corporations and corrupt authorities. The systemic destruction of the environment has always been associated to organized crime because where there's profit, criminals loiter around. So we need to do more to protect defenders like Isabel Zuleta. Let's talk about what needs to be done because this is an urgent topic. This is the Faces of Assassination from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I am Siria Gastelum Felix, Resilience Director at the Global Initiative. Throughout this series of podcasts, we'll be hearing stories of those who fought back against organized crime and speaking to those who are organizing the fight back today. And crucially, We will discuss how you can play a part in tackling this important issue by joining the Global Initiative's Assassination Witness Campaign. In the podcast today, we're discussing the role of environmental defenders, why they're being targeted, what is being done right now to combat it, and what can be done to make further change going forward. I'm delighted to say that joining me for the discussion today are... Rachel Cox, campaigner, land and environmental defenders with Global Witness. Liliana Jauregui, senior expert on environmental justice from IUCN, the Dutch National Committee of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Billy Kite, former Global Witness campaigner, now an independent consultant on conflict mitigation and peace building and member of the GI network of experts. Mayara Foley, co-founder of Plataforma Cipo in Brazil and Judy Pasimio, coordinator of LILAC, Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Rights in the Philippines. I'd like to welcome you all to the Faces of Assassination podcast. Let's start by looking at why environmentalists are at risk. Billy Kite, if I can start with you, who are environmentalists and why these people are at such great risk of harassment, stigmatization, and even death, in particular from organized crime groups? Yeah, so an environmental or, or land rights activist is, is anyone who takes peaceful action to protect the environment or, or land rights. These are often ordinary people forced into defending their environment, their natural resources, their way of life against destructive industries like mining, illegal logging, large-scale agriculture, those kinds of industries. And these activists may not even define themselves as, as human rights defenders, given they are on the front line of the battle to save the environment so that you know, they're far removed, far away from the corridors of power, including international human rights architecture mechanisms. You know, some could be indigenous or peasant leaders living in, in remote mountains or faraway forests, protecting their lands, their livelihoods from, from dam projects or infrastructure projects. And others could be, could be park rangers tackling poaching and illegal logging. And equally, they could, they could also be lawyers or journalists or NGO staff working to expose environmental abuse and, and land grabbing. But what they all have in common is they often clash with political, business and criminal interests who collude to steal their natural resources. Now, these, these interests use their influence to marginalize these activists and turn public opinion against them, often branding their actions as, as anti-development or you know, against the country. Many of the activists face years of death threats of criminalization, intimidation, harassment, but often receive you know, little or, or no protection from authorities. 
They play a vital role in protecting climate critical forests and ecosystems, and their work is essential to broader goals like combating climate change and ensuring development for future generations. You know, apart from not just murder that they face, there's other threats that they also have to confront. They face judicial persecution, illegal surveillance, sexual harassment, violent attacks, blackmail, and enforced disappearance, amongst other types of threats. Now, it's difficult to know who is attacking these activists and who is ordering these attacks, because so few are actually held to account. However, there are cases in which media groups and NGOs like Global Witness have identified suspected perpetrators. And many of these actors could be classified as you know, members of organised crime. For example, paramilitary or guerrilla groups in Colombia are deforesting large areas to grow illicit crops and stealing land from local communities, mostly to make cocaine. There are poachers involved in the legal wildlife trade who threatened and killed park rangers and conservationists in the, the DRC and other African countries. We see corrupt state officials and military personnel implicated in killings of environmentalists in Honduras often defending mining and and dam interests that are used to to launder money or been illegally granted by the state to criminal elements. There's also hired gunmen linked to large plantations such as fruit and and coffee in the Philippines who have murdered Filipino activists. Uh, And in Mexico, criminal gangs involved in illegal logging have silenced leaders protesting against, against land grabs. Rachel, you have a response to Billy. I think like Billy gave one of the most comprehensive answers there. But something else in addition to... His answer is essentially that it's important to look at who is being systematically attacked as a result of uh, land environmental activism. So Global Witness has been collecting data specifically on killings of land environmental activists, which um, is the sharp end of attacks. We know that that's not the only threats that they face. And and before they're killed, many activists experience criminalisation, surveillance, are tied up in the judicial system in order to keep them from speaking out. But what we do know is that from Global Witnesses data is that consistently a large number of the victims or land environmental defenders who are attacked and killed, almost 40%, almost consistently year on year, tend to belong to indigenous communities. So Global Witnesses data has shown that between 2015 and 2019, over a third of all fatal attacks have specifically targeted indigenous people despite the fact they only make up 5% of the world's population, you know, showing that they are disproportionately some of the more at-risk land environmental activists across the globe. Thank you, Rachel. And staying with you, in 2019, it was reported that there were more murders than ever before. Then in 2020, of course, came COVID, which has increased the threat against land defenders and also assassinations by organized criminal groups. Can you explain to us this dynamic? Yeah, so Global Witnesses data has shown that year on year, land environmental defenders are the first line of defense against the causes and impacts, particularly of climate breakdown. And, you know, these are communities of people who have played a crucial role in challenging the impacts of destructive industries as these business projects expand onto land and extract more of the world's natural resources. Our report from this year that we released a few weeks ago shows that in 2019, we recorded 212 land environmental activists that were murdered, which is more than four defenders killed on average every week. The trend year on year is showing that things are likely to get worse, but already from this year, early indications do suggest that threats and attacks against land environmental activists have not slowed in the COVID-19 crisis period. In fact, we, you know, we believe that they appear to have accelerated with those already at risk, uh, facing even greater dangers with lockdowns that have occurred worldwide. So restrictions on movement, particularly, are leaving them more vulnerable to attack, whether that's from state forces or organised crime. Thank you, Rachel. And Mayara, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I was perhaps could add a little bit of the Brazilian context in which you've also seen an increase in attacks and violent attacks against environmentalists. But uh, we've also seen a strong increase that's been reported in, in numbers of invasions of indigenous land, which in turn is leading to another catastrophic consequence, which is the death of indigenous people who are being infected by those same external invaders. And because of lack of adequate health care in indigenous land, amongst other things, the COVID-19 mortality rate is nearly 250% higher among indigenous people than the rest of, of the population. So I think that there's something 
at least in the case of Brazil, this becoming way worse in the case of, of the pandemic, of course. Thank you very much, Mariara. Judy, if I could just turn to you, why are indigenous people just so disproportionately at risk? Indigenous peoples, at least the data that we have in the Philippines, more than 50% of the mining concessions are within the ancestral domains of the indigenous peoples. Corporate plantations are within ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. The two major mega dams that are being uh, pushed by the Duterte government are within the ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. And so it has become an obligation of sorts of the indigenous peoples to defend their lands from all of these onslaughts and from all of these attacks against their, against their ancestral territories. Land grabbing is happening by these corporations in very insidious ways using legal mechanisms, but also in some parts of Mindanao, in the southern part of the Philippines. Land grabbing is done by paramilitary groups so that they themselves can sell the lands to these corporations. And so listening to Rachel and her giving the the statistics, it is really comprehensible why such disproportionate threats and killings are happening within the ancestral domains. It is because the indigenous peoples are in the forefront of being attacked and also are in the forefront of defending their lands. This podcast is focused on the lethal violence against environmentalists. But during the lockdown, it has been reported that some governments have took advantage of the shrinking of civic space to advance their harassment against environmentalists. And we have seen an increase of threats and criminalization. This is the case of the Philippines. The country has just passed the Anti-Terrorist Act of 2020, which raises concerns about the rights and work of human rights defenders, in particularly land defenders. Judy, can you tell us how these labels weaken defenders and make them even more vulnerable? How's the situation of women in this context? Yeah, the Anti-Terrorism Act was railroaded during the time of pandemic. It has been railroaded because the government wants to project that terrorism is the main enemy of uh, that the Philippines is facing now. And one of the main problems of the Anti-Terrorism Act is the deliberate ambiguity of the term acts of terrorism or who is a terrorist. A lot of discretion is left to the state enforcers on what are suspected acts of terrorism. Even intent or inciting, all of these actions are perceived intent, could be a basis of arrest. And so this has chilling effect. Rallies and mobilizations in the past months during COVID pictures were posted and the attendees such as us were labeled as terrorists by the Philippine Communications Operations Office itself. Members of the Communist Party of the Philippines, with whom Duterte, the president, had quite an intimate relationship with prior election in the first few months of his administration. Now he says they are terrorists because I say so. What he says is the law for the state enforcers. Labeling of terrorists, or as we say in the Philippines, red tagging, has indeed chilling effect. Now during lockdown, ordinary citizens, students who would express disappointments, anger, criticisms would be visited by the National Bureau of Investigation in their homes or by the village police. With the Anti-Terror Act, it institutionalizes red tagging. But not does it only have chilling effect. In the past few days, we have witnessed that this have killing effects. Randy Echanis, a 72-year-old peasant leader, was brutally killed in his home a few days ago. Last night, a 39-year-old mother, Zara Alvarez, a human rights defender working in the province, was shot to death. Both of them were on a terrorist list issued by the Duterte government two years ago, containing more than 600 names, a lot of which are names of indigenous people's leaders, active even at the international level. The United Nations Special Rapporteur of the Indigenous Peoples at that time was also on the list. To defend your land, your rights are acts of terrorism for this government. And so this law, this act of terrorism, legitimizes red tagging and killing of human rights defenders. This law institutionalizes state impunity. And Mayara, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, I think it was very interesting to hear what Judy just said, because I think there's some parallels, again, that can be drawn with, with the Brazilian case. 
And the issue of terrorism is not a major issue in Brazil. So until very recently, we didn't have a law to tackle the problem. But this had to be created uh, in 2016 as a result of Rio's hosting the Olympic Games. And as in the Philippines, the le legislation approved adopt a very broad definition of what terrorism is and what terrorists are, which immediately sparked huge concerns among human rights groups that the legislation would be used to criminalize social movements and social protests. And this hasn't been the case yet, but naturally we've seen a, a, an increase in authoritarian tendencies in the country. So I wouldn't be surprised if this anti-terrorism legislation started to be used to target social groups and activists in, in general. Thank you for that. And actually, Mayara, staying with you, one of the drivers of threats against defenders are the governmental policies, which prioritize the extractivist agenda over human rights in general. In Brazil, where a large number of land defenders and indigenous people die per year, voices are saying that the president's stance had deteriorated the situation in the country. Could you explain why these policies are a threat and how this dynamic takes place in Brazil? Sure. I think it's worth acknowledging that Brazil has historically been a dangerous country for human rights defenders. Since the international recognized environmentalist Chico Mendes was murdered in the late 80s, hundreds and hundreds of Brazilians have had their lives taken away as a result of the activism in defense of the environment. And I'd say that the drivers of this violence are to a large extent associated with the difficulty that the Brazilian government has historically had in implementing strategies that are capable of both promoting the economic development and higher standards of living for Brazilians, while at the same time protecting the environment. And although this challenge is not new, you are absolutely correct in your assessment that things have deteriorate, deteriorated under the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro. And why is that? I think, well, Bolsonaro and his allies have openly and systematically supported the interests of large landowners and corporations at the expense of environmental preservation. His administration is, for instance, creating barriers to suspend the process of demarcation of indigenous territories, which is unconstitutional. He has also sharply cut the resources and number of civil servants allocated to fight environmental crimes. He has prohibited the destruction of machinery used by illegal miners and illegal loggers who are caught committing crimes. And this list could go on and on. You've probably seen on the news that Brazil's Minister of Environment was caught on tape declaring that the COVID-19 pandemic, which has already killed over 100,000 Brazilians, offer a great opportunity for the government to dismantle environmental legislation without receiving much attention. So this mentality has naturally had catastrophic consequences. We've seen a record increase in deforestation rates in the Amazon in over a decade. We've seen an increase in indigenous land invasions, as I said earlier. And there's, of course, been an increase in the number of murders or attempted murders as a result of land disputes, which mostly target not only indigenous people and environmentalists, but also small farmers, peasants and union leaders who are also more vulnerable to other types of violence, as was mentioned here by Billy, not only little violence, but they are also more vulnerable to physical aggressions, forced evictions and expulsions all of which are becoming ever more frequent under the anti-environmental government of, of Jair Bolsonaro. Thank you very much for that answer, Mayara. So what steps have already been taken to protect environmentalists and land defenders now? And what needs to be done in the future? Billy, we've seen that in many cases, people report the threats to authorities, but still governments are not able to prevent the murders. Why is there such a general failure of governments to prevent the assassination and to protect environmentalists doing this vital work? Mm, yeah, no, it's a good question. So, I mean, as you say, you know, so few perpetrators of killings of defenders are ever brought to justice due to the failures of governments to properly investigate or prosecute anyone for these crimes. So we're seeing many authorities turning a blind eye or, or even actively impeding investigations into these killings. Now, this is principally due to the collusion that we see between corporate and state interests, which are the principal suspects in these murders. This is true, for instance, in the case of the murder of Berta Cáceres, the renowned Honduran activist who was killed by a combination of state and corporate interests. So governments are, are putting profit over protection and vilifying those they deem to be anti-development or against the state. 
So these activists are often at a loggerhead with state officials who, you know, may be getting kickbacks or have personal financial interests in the companies that are damaging the environment and the way of life of indigenous communities. And there's also an aspect of short-termism and what governments see as, you know, boosting the economy by exploiting natural resources, which is further compounding the problem and the issue. But many of the victims come, as we've heard previously, from marginalised communities such as indigenous peoples, who have been historically sidelined and discriminated against by governments. We also see the rule of law, which is you know, very weak in many of these countries where governments are failing to protect activists. So all of this leads to a lack of protection by the authorities and a failure to investigate crimes. Corruption is also allowing government officials and businesses to, to collude in grabbing land or imposing business projects on communities. And in so many of these cases, there is a lack of respect for the free, prior and informed consent of communities regarding the use of their land and the natural resources, which is driving these conflicts. So when communities are excluded from the outset, they have no choice but to stand up for their rights, pushing them on a collision course with, with these powerful interests. Thank you very much, Billy. And Judy, you'd like to come in there? Yeah, I just wanted to illustrate what Billy was saying in the Philippines, because the question is premised that the government recognizes that these are assassinations of environmentalists. But in the Philippines, these are not considered assassinations. They spin the killings as a common crime, robbery or crime of passion even, or in the indigenous communities, they declare it as tribal wars because they use indigenous peoples as paramilitary forces, or they use the traditional warrior structure of the indigenous peoples and they pit them against each other. So it's never about the killings of environmentalists. And then again, they are portrayed as rebels, such as the case of the what is now known as the Tamasco Massacre two years ago in Lake Cebu, where an indigenous chieftain was killed along with his son and two sons-in-law and four more male members of the tribe. They were killed by military men. And they were identified, the 27th and 33rd Infantry Battalions. And the indigenous communities have been struggling for decades against the coffee plantations in their territories. But now it's an almost closed case because it was the press release is that it was a, an encounter between the rebels and the military. So, so yeah, unless the government recognizes that the peoples are actually environmentalists, are actually human rights defenders, then the crimes against them will never be considered as such and that the crimes against them will never be resolved and prevented. Thank you very much, Judy. Liliana, if I could turn to you, your work focuses on specific interventions to improve the safety of environmental defenders. From your experience, which are effective mechanisms to mitigate the risk of assassinations? Yes, thank you for the question and for the invitation. First of all, we think that it's important to address the root causes, which are the inequality, huh? the inequality in wealth, the inequality in power, indigenous peoples that are managing almost 80% of the biodiversity of the world are the least hurt in the decision making. Uh, secondly, I think, and we have, I just heard Judy saying this, we have to combat this hate speech. We hear this, the terrorist attack laws being used and all these governments uh, labeling defenders as against development. So we have to change the narrative and, and show the value of these people achieving their sustainable development goals and, and display more positive images across the media so that these people are not attacked and the attacks are legitimized by local communities. Uh, but we have also some very concrete uh, combination of several interventions that are showing some results. For example, we are allocating flexible funding in, in certain areas in the world, like in DRC, also in the Philippines, in Indonesia and Colombia, areas where local people can decide uh, with small funding what to do and where to invest. And that can be on surveillance, on lawyers, on trainings, very small things, but that it can help people in the very concrete cases. Uh, secondly, we're also investing in uh, support and exchanging with, with several different networks. Uh, we are seeing uh, many new initiatives starting, so we are profiting a lot of this uh, kind of connections and uh, learning from, uh, from these groups. Uh, and thirdly, I would say uh, we're investing in security and resilience trainings, security management, uh, because as Billy said before, many of these 
leaders uh, don't see themselves as uh, defenders. So what we are doing is trying to support uh, collective and territorial protection, uh, provide trainings on digital uh, security, but also on evidence collection. And we are paying particular attention to women and women human rights defenders, because in, in several uh, research, we have seen that they uh, are more vulnerable to attacks and certain kind of violence. And we have started some uh, groups, for example, in the Philippines with Judy, uh, a group that Judy is leading, where uh, the resistor dialogue, for example, uh, has started and they are sharing uh, different strategies, uh, strategies and insight where they reflect uh, from their victories and connect uh, their, uh, their local causes to international levels. And we have also, for example, a very, a very small initiative in, in the Chaco, but it's showing very good results where a group of women in the Chaco, for, uh, just to explain, the Chaco is a, a dry forest in the region of Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Brazil and Paraguay. With this app, this group of women are exchanging photos, uh, voice notes and georeferenced data and it compiles complaints and threats. This information is directly sent from the ground to international partners and also UN groups. And this is breaking also one of the enabling factors, which is isolation. And at the moment we have a case which is moving forward within the UN, which is fully based on information coming from this data compiled by this app from the cell phones. Thank you very much, Liliana. And I just wanted to actually quickly ask a question to Rachel. There seems to be an underreporting of assassinations of environmentalists in regions such as Africa. What are organizations like yours doing to gather the information that is missing? Yeah, sure. So we've heard Judy talk about the Philippines where the land environmental activists or defenders or even indigenous activists, no matter how they, they term themselves, the work that they're doing is delegitimized by the government or by companies, even the media. And this has huge impact for communities on the ground in terms of undermining the work that they're doing and leading them to be more at risk. But it also has a huge impact for organizations like Global Witness who are predominantly relying on public sources of information in order to collect our data. Again, one of the reasons why we're so reliant on, on gathering public reporting is because we, you know, we know that cases of land environmental activists uh, who have been threatened or killed often don't come to justice. So it's very difficult to access uh, judicial records or to point cases where people have been killed and then the perpetrators of that killing, uh, whether the person that pulled the trigger or the intellectual authors of that defender's murder have been brought to justice. So we are very reliant on, on public information and that brings us to a whole host of challenges. You know, in regions of the world where there's media repression, there's less reporting on communities that are taking action against or standing up and speaking out against oppressive governments. We know that there are areas in the world where even the language of land environmental activism isn't, isn't used and therefore media isn't necessarily focusing on the actions and the kind of rights activism that is going on on the ground. So this makes it difficult for organizations like ours to rely on public reporting that isn't necessarily there, which is why we we take the firm action to try and build up concrete relationships with communities that are working on the ground. But that in itself also can be difficult in regions where there is less active civil society uh, working on these particular issues or working on environmental issues, which again can, can lead us to likely under-report on the number of attacks that are occurring worldwide. Thanks for that, Rachel. Liliana? Yes, I just wanted to say that, that the problem of, of, of data information gathering is, is not only a problem in Africa, it's, it's all over the world. And the information that is available through, through the good research the Global Witness is doing is only, only the top of the iceberg. Before someone is killed, there is a lot happening before, and, and that kind of information we still need. So gather more information about threats and what kind of threats are happening and who is actually being targeted to anticipate and prevent the assassinations. And that kind of information is at the moment not available or, or very scarce. Judy, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, just very quickly to say that all of those that have been said are factors of lack of data, but also 
at the community level, the lack of trust to the justice system. I was in a community meeting one time and there were six widowers in a group of 12. So half, half of the half of the women we were talking to are actually widowers. And when we talked about how their husbands died, some of them, they actually know who did them and why, because of the land issues. But they would not report because they say, what will happen anyway? Nothing. No justice will ever be served. So this lack of trust to the justice system has really resulted to underreporting of the violence that's happening on the ground. Thank you very much, Judy. Rachel, turning back to you, besides states' authorities, we have seen an increasing role of the involvement of non-state actors. Mining has been the most culpable industry. At the Resilience Fund, we have fellows looking into disappearances in mining projects in Venezuela and Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example. But also communities opposing oil, gas, and coal projects are under constant threat. How these networks operate and what private corporations, which are at times responsible for these threats, should be doing to avoid this? Thanks for that question. I think Liliana talked about tackling the root causes, and that's something we would definitely advocate for. It's about companies offering efficient and regular monitoring of the local landscapes in which they're operating. So there isn't a, a one fix all tick box list that companies should be using. They should be thinking about a local context and the likelihood and whether there's a history of reprisals against communities who speak out. They should be checking up and doing proper due diligence on other organizations or businesses that they work with, proper consultation, uh, but also ensuring that they quite clearly state that they have a zero tolerance stance on threats and attacks against defenders and illegal land acquisition to begin with. Like It seems simple, but many companies don't even state that amongst their, their policy documents. Companies should be thinking about how they can be allies to local communities. You know, we heard Judy talking about the delegitimization by governments of defenders. Well, I think if companies know that that's happening in their operating space, they need to be more actively and publicly condemning threats and attacks against defenders whenever they're occurring, even if they're not directly associated with their particular business project. And that's to ensure that there is a a more consistent voice that's occurring, not just from local communities or NGOs who are working on these issues, but across the business world who are taking a stance of, of zero tolerance when it comes to reprisals. Thank you very much, Rachel. And Judy, what's the importance and impact of consultations in the affected communities in preventing conflicts and death? Well, communities have to know their rights, including their right to say no. This may not necessarily prevent conflicts and will probably cost more because those who stand up for their rights are those who have been consistently attacked, maligned, harassed. But knowing their rights give them confidence and therefore are able to assert these rights. This is especially true for indigenous women in the Philippines. Their right to participate in decision-making, affecting their land, their resources. This is is something that has been deliberately weakened by corporations. Because most of the time, in our experience, the indigenous women have very deep relationship with their food sources, their food production practices. So they are not easily swayed by the promises of the mining companies of better future, better lives. So they have been systematically marginalized in consultation processes by the government and even the process of getting free prior informed consent. It is then very important to have learning sessions and consultations with women at the local level. But also very important is um, consultations and conversations with the entire communities and not just women. Again, in our experience in the Philippines, these conversations with the communities, including the tribal councils, which are predominantly male, are led by the indigenous women themselves. These discussions on um, land grabbing, on threats against the lives of their leaders, and the killings that are happening elsewhere are important to have so that everyone is aware and that they are prepared to protect or provide protection for each other. An example of this happened very recently. LILAC has a COVID-19 response work with indigenous women where we raise funds for relief food packs and hygiene kits. A number of our partners have experienced harassment from the military. One case was uh, with Heidi, uh, an indigenous woman leader. Her small village was visited by four military trucks, small village in Agusan in Mindanao. And the members of the tribal council came out 
not her, and asked why were the military men were asking for her. The men said, well, because we suspect that she is supporting the rebels in the mountains as she was seen distributing food and supplies. And so it was the tribal council and the local village leaders who faced the military and explained the relief work that she was leading, who Lilak was, my organization, and that she's not supporting the rebels. After that, they came up with their own security protocol for her. So it is, of course, very important that we have a more comprehensive and broader security protocols for community human rights defenders at the national level. But um, at the end of the day, especially now in the times of COVID where lockdowns are still implemented in various areas, local web of care is the immediate key for them. And so the, it's very important that consultations are regularly happening on the ground. Thank you very much for that answer, Yudi. And Liliana, if I can turn to you, one of the issues is a culture of widespread impunity in some of the places where these assassinations happen. You mentioned to us that the issue of impunity is an enabling factor to these assassinations. Why do you think perpetrators and criminal groups have some sort of confidence that they would not be brought to justice? And what do you think needs to be done to tackle this issue? Yes, indeed, this is this is a dangerous enable, enabling strategy. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are people in, in areas where there is already a weak rule of law. So this is a condition, a uh, pre-existing condition where these uh, defenders are living. Uh, according to, to, to some statistics, very, very few cases, less than 1% is actually uh, of the legal cases is, is convicted and, and punished. Uh, and the majority of the cases uh, are uh, end up with, with almost no information and a few with, with names of, of, su of suspects. So this is a very bad statistics if you are starting a legal case uh, to bring people to jail. Uh, the the only cases that you that you see are uh, successful are the ones where uh, there is international pressure. So the case of, of Berta Cáceres, indeed, the indigenous leader uh, from Honduras, murdered in uh, 2016, uh, and another case in Costa Rica, for example, Jairo Sandoval. He was a, a a leather a total uh, conservationist killed in 2013, but only with international pressure. Uh, from outside the country, uh, this, this, uh, the, 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 these people were brought to, to, to justice. Uh, otherwise, the risk to end up in jail is, is very minimal, and the gain is, is high and is very prof profitable. So the, to, to go that road is pretty much uh, hopeless. Um, I think, and I, I'm not the only one thinking uh, this, but the the another the the other enabling factor is, of course, the intersection of another illegal networks that make possible that just hiring a hitman for a couple of hundred dollars, you can kill someone uh, easily and relatively uh, cheap, and uh, and the corruption uh, of. Uh, of you know prosecutors and and police, uh, so th that that are the conditions. How can you change uh, this? It's uh, what we are doing at the moment is trying to uh, choose some exemplar exemplary cases so that you can standardize uh, the way that organizations and people can operate. We are trying also to. Uh, create some capacity to gather evidence uh, and to help communities uh, to gather consistent evidence to contribute to the cases themselves. And uh, in, the, in the more systemic change, we want to, of course, uh, combat this uh, language of uh, hate speech that I said before, so that the people that are seen as enemies of the states stay within the rule of law and they are protected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. And Mayara, in Brazil, impunity is reportedly quite an issue. Are there any measures that have been put in place to tackle this problem in the country? And what do you think needs to be done to identify the perpetrators and bring them to justice? Yeah, you are absolutely right. Impunity is a major problem in Brazil. And it's worth mentioning that this has been the case even before President Bolsonaro took office. 
for instance, of the 300 people murdered as a result of conflicts over the use of land and natural resources in the Amazon region in the last decade, only 14 cases resulted in a conviction. And to make matters worse, when you think of environmental crimes, which is often the root cause of conflict and tension around land, land, less than 5% of the fines imposed for environmental crimes in Brazil are actually paid by perpetrators who often take advantage of highly bureaucratic and slow-paced appeal procedure. So as you can see, there is a lot that needs to be done. But Answering your question, sadly, no, at least at the federal level, there's not much being done to end impunity by Brazil's current administration. To the contrary, the president's discourse in favor of allowing the exploitation of natural resources at any cost, including indigenous land and without indigenous people's consent, which is, of course, illegal, this sends a message of impunity that might further increase the, the violent attacks uh, faced by environmental defenders. And we know that putting an end into impunity is not a simple task, but it would at the very least require a stronger allocation of resources to local police forces and prosecutors to enhance the investigative capacity. It would also require a strong witness protection program. And this topic has been uh, mentioned a few times here. It would be very important to allow local populations to share evidence and information without fearing for their lives and without risking becoming a target of violence themselves, as it is often the case, not only in Brazil, but in Latin America and other parts of the world. But to end impunity in the country would be essential to place a greater focus on prevention to stop assassinations from happening in the first place. Again, it was mentioned here, there's plenty of research and evidence showing that before being murdered, a large number of land defenders received systematic death threats, which even when reported are often not investigated by local authorities who lack adequate resources and often political will. And this leads to my final point. I'd say that making the protection of environmental defenders a priority requires political will from decision makers, which it's very difficult to achieve in a country where the highest authority keeps adding fuel to an already burning forest. And finally, there is a concern about the increase in the danger for land defenders post-pandemic. Threats and attacks against environmental activists have not slowed down during COVID-19. Global Witness has reported that attacks appear to have accelerated from South America to West Africa and into Southeast Asia. There will be pressure to exploit natural resources to spur on an economic recovery, which consequentially opens up space for those who are involved in illicit activities to do the same. And it's land and indigenous people defenders who are the ones that suffer the greater risk. This is a question for everyone. How do you think we should look at this issue? What needs to be done to increase the protection of this group at the international, regional, and national level? Rachel, if I could start with you. Yep, yeah, sure. Actually, thinking about the context of the pandemic, as we kind of come out of it, there's a lot of discussion globally about how we are going to recover. And your question talked about the pressure that could or will inevitably be put on natural resources in order to recover the economy. And as a result of that, it's inevitable that there will be increased localised conflict with communities as the kind of push for more land takes hold. But it's interesting to think about how this pandemic also offers us an opportunity as governments, as NGOs, to think about what we mean when we talk about bu building a green economy, how we envisage that. And something that has been missing in the rhetoric for me is about what actually environmental justice looks like and ensuring that environmental justice is at the heart of these discussions of, of building an, a green economy. So it's about expanding our language to think about environmental justice being something that we tackle not just in a very narrow definition of the word, but more broadly around um, ensuring that part of those discussions are about tackling broader economic and social inequalities that are already at the heart of our political and business systems. And until we do that, I think the notion of environmental justice is, is very small. And this is partly what land environmental activists uh, find themselves up against. So a lot of the 
conflict against communities, a lot of the threats are born from the fact that their communities realize that they're operating in, in a very unjust system, that they're not benefiting necessarily economically from business projects that are encroaching on their land, that they didn't have a fair choice or a fair say, their voices aren't being heard. So uh, yeah, for me, the, this pandemic we can use it as an opportunity to change the way that we talk about environmental justice going forward. And that will be one of the biggest assets for campaigning on land environmental issues. Thank you, Rachel. Judy? This is a moment that we have to push the change of development framework that our governments are pushing, corporate-led, extractive. This is a moment that we, we should be able to articulate and push in creative ways uh, for a caring and nurturing development framework. Caring for the environment and the people within it, and that will balance the inequalities within our societies. And how do we protect our indigenous leaders and our ourselves as human rights defenders? To increase our protection, we need to decrease the threats if not totally eradicate these threats. And for us in the Philippines, our major threat is this administration. And so we're working on elections in 2022. We need to work hard in bringing the issue of environmental justice and human rights as an election issue. We need to start breaking down the language of violence and the institutions that perpetuate it. But I think the pause that we're experiencing now should be able to push us for a more energized struggle, for a better tomorrow post-pandemic or within this pandemic that we're facing. Thank you very much, Judy. And Billy, could I turn to you and ask you the same question? What do you think needs to be done to increase the protection of land and indigenous people defenders and how can we increase their protection? Yeah, I think it's really important that we have to change the narrative around environmental defenders, particularly in the countries where they are being threatened. So too often there's a negative public discourse around their actions being impediments to economic progress and, and development. So we really have to push positive narratives around what they are achieving, which in many cases is sustainable and inclusive development. And if there's anything that this pandemic has taught us, I think it's, you know, it's to trust in science and prepare for the impacts of global challenges, working in cooperation and across borders. And of course, of these issues, perhaps the biggest uh, is climate change. So we need to harness the lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis and ensure that those on the front line of the battle against climate change, these environmental land defenders, are protected, their actions are honoured and not denigrated. Thank you very much, Billy. Now, Mayara? I think both the international community and also regional organizations have a very important role to play in ensuring that the post-COVID-19 world does not become even more dangerous for environmentalists. And I'd say that they could do that in two principal ways. Firstly, by utilizing their human rights mechanisms to raise attention to violence against environmental defenders and ensuring that the governments are held into account when they fail to protect those people. And secondly, I think the international community in broader terms, so it would, of course, include private sector actors and development banks and agencies, should allocate more predictable resources to support local NGOs and other civil society organizations who, despite being highly underfunded and understaffed, are on the ground providing essential support to vulnerable groups and denouncing the illicit activities associated with the exploitation of natural resources. So in conclusion, yeah, I think both the international community and civil society can have a major role to play, especially in countries like mine, Brazil, where government figures are hostile towards the environment and towards those who defend it. Thank you very much, Mayara. And finally, back to Liliana. Yes, thank you. Two things I, I want to mention. One is that I, I think that watchdog have to continue to monitor the, all these new deals that are being signed at the moment. We don't have to wait till after the pandemic. Many, many deals are being signed at the moment. We have clear signals. And also to ask investments and governments 
that the recovery package comply with conditions for human rights and nature protection to assure inclusive development. That's in, in, the, in the long term. But I think a new opportunity is there for us to end up with in a positive note that this pandemic shows that the, the value of protecting nature and with this new zoonotic diseases, the more the importance of stop nature degradation, which is linked to this new pandemic, is important. So I think we have have to use and make use of the momentum that these nature and environmental human rights defenders are of importance for all of us to prevent future pandemic. Thank you all for those answers. These environmental defenders are trying to protect their communities against powerful interests, powerful interests that are exploiting the natural resources of the planet. Their predatory behavior decays society through corruption, intimidation, and violence. These brave defenders of the natural environment and indigenous communities are also protecting us all. They are our defenders and we should come together for their protection. Thank you very much, everyone, for the discussion today and for coming on the Faces of Assassination podcast. Rachel Cox, Liliana Jauregui, Billy Kite, Mayara Foley, and Judy Pasimio. thank you very much. That's it for today's episode of the Faces of Assassination podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Please go to our website, assassination.globalinitiative.net. Subscribe to our newsletter in this podcast series. Help us remember the death anniversaries using our hashtag, Assassination Witness. You can also download a free ebook which profiles 50 victims of assassination who have yet to receive justice. For example, you can hear the story of Berta Cáceres, the formidable environmentalist and indigenous rights campaigner who was murdered in Honduras in 2016. The best tribute you can pay to the courageous people who stood up to crime is to keep their memories alive and with our collective memory shine a light into this darkness. Please remember to rate and subscribe to this podcast. It helps us get noticed and get these stories out This was the Faces of Assassination podcast. I am Siria Gastelum-Felix. Thank you for listening.